together a very good campaign. We decided back in 2003, prior to the 2004 campaign, that it would be useful to run a straw poll that provided an opportunity for candidates to actually raise money for their own campaigns. So part of the nature of this event is that if you hear somebody speaking today, and, and we have one presidential candidate who actually has the opportunity to speak live to you, and he'll be coming on momentarily, um, and or one of the representatives, and we'll introduce them later, um, and you like what that campaign is about, we hope that you'll be generous with your donations to their campaign. The way it works is we're going to collect all of the checks and Bitcoin or other pledge items that are legitimate to use for pledging for that candidate. And the committee um, will count those funds while you're having your lunch. <laughs> and whoever raises the most money will win the straw poll. So that's how this works. Um, we will then surrender those funds to each of the campaign's representatives. If you do not have a campaign representative here today, it's because they didn't bother to send them. So I first want to say thank you to um, the representatives we have to tell uh, the leaders in a moment um, and for taking the time to come to speak to the Michigan uh, delegation. Um, it's a great honor for us to have people come and participate. And um, we, we had a great time four years ago, very, very successful. And I hope all of you get very engaged today, ask all the questions that you can, and learn as much as you can about the various campaigns that are here. Uh, with that, I want to introduce our state chair. Kim McCurry is in her first term as the, uh, chairman of the Libertarian Party of Michigan, was elected at the state convention in Kalamazoo uh, past uh, May, and uh, very worked very hard. I mean, I asked her to spend a, just a couple minutes talking about some of the initiatives that we've been involved in. Hopefully, many of you are involved in them as well. But for those of you who are new here, I, there were some folks that told me this morning they drove down from Marquette, and I, back of the room. That, that is really wonderful, and, and for all of you, a big part of what the party is about is getting involved so that we can extend our message and, and make sure that all the voters out there know what the Libertarian Party is about. So with that, I'm going to introduce Good morning. First, I'd like to thank you for all coming today. Not many people want to come out on a Saturday for politics. As Bill said, we've attempted to implement several teams, and many things have happened throughout the year. We've had loss of parents or other family members. We've had illnesses that have had step off of the board, but we all we have still accomplished one of the major things that we've been working on for the past five years. We have a new website up. It's still in the process of having everything changed over, but we are in a new time where it's actually mobile friendly. Our last website was nowhere near mobile friendly. Along with working with the website, we're working on updating our database so that we can integrate the two so that we'll be able to send out emails much more efficiently and keep track of those that we send regular mailings to. The database we are using now was uh, timed out. It wasn't working well with an internet browser, so we've been then using Excel for the past couple of years, and now we're ready to upgrade to a newer system again. National has actually been very helpful with us in updating our website and our database. Going forward, I hope that we can work with other states as well as uh, national and working out systems. It's not more recreating a system if we can share ideas. In addition, we are working on um, trying to build up our membership, and I am very happy to say <coughs> that for the first time I've been a member of this party, we are back over 140 members. I'm sure after our national membership is back over 400. And we hope that this year's presidential campaign, since we have so many viable 
well, there is one person here who was not able to participate because he wasn't able to get in in time because he didn't announce till later. So there is another presidential candidate that is able to be talked to too. And there, that person is right from Michigan. And then, I guess I'll turn this back over to Bill to introduce our presidential
But I grew up just outside Washington, D.C. at the Hospital in Washington, D.C. And uh, growing up in the D.C. area, I uh, got to know some politicians. Uh, uh, my uh, roommate in college had uh, three uncles who were so. uh, one man right, from the president of Ukraine and two of his brothers, the, the great brothers of Ukraine from Congress. Uh, the, he's called the Kennedy of the Rain. So I, I know people, but mm -hmm. what you find is that politicians, their job is to control people. That's how they get power. They get power by controlling people, and they control people because they have power. And it feeds on itself until it becomes very powerful people who control people. And they do it mostly with what they say. And they say things that motivate and inspire people. But I'll tell you a secret. They don't mean it. They don't, they talk about principles. Uh, one of my uh, favorite lines from John Stewart about the Libertarian Party. He said, the Libertarian Party says they want uh, more freedom, lower taxes. It's uh, really, uh, what's the difference between them and the Republicans? Oh, they actually want to do that. <coughs> That's the difference. We have commitment to principles. We're the party of principles. Uh, I tell people that uh, before Obama's first term, I was concerned that he had a set of principles that were dangerous for America. Uh, after his first term, I felt much better about him because I felt he had no principles at all. <laughs> and you know, uh, this is why we have, we have to face reality about what we are facing. Uh, I was having a discussion with uh, someone uh, high up in the uh, Republican Liberty Coalition. I have a hard time saying Liberty Republicans, kind of like military intelligence or jumbo shrimp. One of these <laughs> But uh, we were explaining why the other one can't possibly win. And he started first. He said, you know, but you a lot of great ideas, and I agree with almost all of them. He said, but you can't win because the Republican Party is so much larger and has so much more money and power. Whatever issue the libertarians come up with, whether it's uh, same-sex marriage or uh, gun rights or marijuana legalization or civil asset forfeiture, if it starts getting traction in the public, the Republican Party will jump on it bigger and louder and will look like they invented it. So you might as well just give up because there's no way you can win. I said, no, that's interesting because my main libertarian issue is the corrupting influence of money in politics and that money in politics is being used to take away our freedom which to me means to try to control us. So uh, my major thrust of my campaign, what makes my campaign different, is that anyone can donate to my campaign with a $5 maximum. I don't accept more than $5 for the individual. Now, I'm not uh, against, uh, you know, I'm not against, I tell people uh, as a physician, I'm against morbid obesity, but it doesn't mean I'm totally against food. You know, I have no problem with money, and in fact, uh, I'm going to be asking today for your money, uh, $5 from me, and the rest to support the Libertarian Party of Michigan. But I, I explained to this fellow, I said, what if my $5 maximum caught on and started to get uh, approval by the public, 1%, 3%, 5%, 7%, 7%? Do you think the Republican Party could get in front of that? You thought for a few seconds and very quietly said, no, I don't think so. So this is uh, the way I see it. When I say that it's possible that we can win, we need to find a path. And I think that this is one one path to success. Uh, you know, I think everyone as kids does these uh, mazes where, you know, you see these big, you know, with the car trip, you want the kids to be quiet, sometimes you give them a, a puzzle book. And uh, if you get this big puzzle with all these different pathways, most uh, kids figure out at some point that uh, you know that it's possible. So if you start at the end and work your way backwards to the start, a lot of times it's a lot easier. So that's what I what I did is in terms of running for, for president. Start at the end because that way you're never facing anything that's impossible because you you know you already got it. So let's say that I'm already in, in government. Well, well. How could we move our government in a libertarian direction? Uh, 
president is not a king. The president only has limited power. So how can a president move, even if a president won, we're now assuming that a party won, how can you move our government, our country, in the right direction? And I actually got the idea from my, in, in 2010, from my uh, uh, campaign for attorney general. I was looking for uh, a, uh, to do the website. So I was looking at old websites of, of Ohio attorney generals, just so I could get the border plate legal things to put on the contribution. And uh, I came across one where one of the, the candidates said uh, that you could sh each taxpayer could shrink the government. How could they shrink the government of Ohio? He said, by donating to my campaign. Because the uh, state of Ohio has a balanced budget. Of it. The budget must be balanced. And offers a $25 dollar-for-dollar dollar rebate to your taxes for campaign contributions to statewide office. So if you donate $25 from your tax liability to the uh, campaign of the attorney general, that's $25 less that the Ohio government gets in taxes, which means the Ohio government has to cut the size of the government by $25. Well, uh, and, and this shows you, uh, you know, most things in, uh, in your, that, are, that you can take off your taxes are tax deductions. They just make your total income smaller by a little bit. It saves you a little bit on taxes. Uh, then there's only one thing that, that uh, or very few things, Maybe the only thing that government gives you a dollar for dollar uh, uh, rebate, and that's the thing that's most important to our government, and that's campaign contributions. Uh, the uh, you know, not donations for, for children or for national security, but I think still uh, it, uh, you can donate three dollars or six dollars as a couple and take that three or six dollars right off your taxes to give to a presidential campaign. And I thought, well, you know. This makes a lot of sense. Why don't we expand it? Why don't we make all charitable contributions dollar for dollar rebates? Uh, so anyone can donate money to the charity of their choice and take that money directly off their taxes. Why should we pay government to take care of people when we can decide how to take care of people ourselves more efficiently, more effectively? Now, when you compare that, when you combine that with a balanced budget, then this allows us to change the incentive system of the whole government. So my balance and credit plan for our country involves two things. Number one, balance the budget and keep it balanced. Uh, you think it's hard, it's not hard. Uh, I'm going to try to save some time. Uh, who's in charge of time? Can you uh, let me know when I have about uh, 20 minutes left? And we'll see what's the Because I can keep talking. My wife says, don't get our apology. And this is the longest time I've ever had. So, so uh, but you'll see, is I won't run out. But if you'll uh, let me give you a 20 minute high side, we'll switch to where you We have 25 minutes? Okay, so we're almost there. So, so we'll say to how to do it. But let's say we're going to balance the budget and keep it balanced, number one. Number two, change uh, uh, our taxes from uh, the tax from Charitable deductions from, uh, from deductions to rebates. Now, uh, uh, so what it does is basically, when you keep a balanced budget, if billions and billions of dollars are taken out of the IRS by taxpayers and go directly to private foundations and organizations and local charities, then the government has to cut its budget by the same amount, or else your budget won't be balanced. But now it doesn't have to be done on political factors. It can be done with data because the government knows what people are donating to. If people are donating to education, then we ought to be able to cut to the part of education. If people are donating to, uh, to uh, uh, veterans organizations, we be able to cut the veterans administration. But it's a way to shrink the government dramatically and drastically without decreasing the benefits to the people who need them. And in fact, if you believe as I do that private organizations and taxpayers are better at making decisions and actually helping people than government, the government agency, then there actually should be an increase in the benefits to people while government shrinks like a bounce house when you pull the plug. So, so, we, so I do have a system for government. Now, the next question is, if that, so let's work backwards. Okay, so 
if that works, how did I get there? If it's going to take a lot of power and wealth from people, how could, they, how could the, the multinational corporations, the special interests, the whole political machine allow it to happen? You know, I'm just one person. If I'm going to do this personally, what's to stop them from using the media to assassinate my character or a bullet to the back of the head? You know, we're talking about billions of dollars. Well, the answer is, it can't be about me. I can't be seen as the uh, eloquent spokesman, the shining boy, the, the uh, fellow with the melodious, hypnotizing voice who's able to convince you of things. People have to support me only because of my idea. Because you can't kill an idea. You can't, you can throw dirt on an idea and still comes back. Now what about me as a person? I tell people that, that you know, my only personal quality, I think, that uh, uh, makes it easier for me to run for president is I've got probably the thickest skin of any candidate you can imagine. In fact, if someone comes up to me and goes, Dr. Feldman, I agree with everything you said. I'd say there must be something wrong with you. Because I want you to think for yourself. Oh, I agree with that too. But that's all right. I want people to think for themselves. Because I'm all about individual power. And the, the last thing I want to, to cover before we go to questions and answers is the idea of control. Because again, people want to talk about freedom and liberty. I want to talk about control. And if there's one thing I want to get through is control is a zero-sum game. You understand the difference between a zero-sum game and a win-win situation. Liberty and freedom sounds like a win-win. I'll give you freedom, you give me freedom, we all have freedom, we all do better, our economy does better, free money, freedom for everybody, everybody does better, nobody loses. But it doesn't work that way. Because to ha really have freedom, you have to have control over yourself. And you need to have not other people control you. And control, unlike the freedom and liberty, control is a zero-sum game. What that means is if political control means the, abil the ability to influence other people's decisions, well, in this country, we have a difference over 300 million people who are decision makers. Three, and those 300 million people can either be followers or they can be controllers. So we have 300 million potential followers and 300 million potential controllers. Now here's how the math works. That means on average, each American controls only one person. And that when there are people who are controlling more than one person, there are other people who are controlling less than one person. So my goal is to maximize the power of individuals to control themselves. And if you do that, that will automatically decrease the power of government, decrease the power of multinational corporations, decrease the power of the wealthy. Because the more control the individual has, the less control everybody else has. So I believe in principles. I'm a candidate of principle for the party of principle. That's why I'm here. I'm not here to be famous. It doesn't help my business. It doesn't, this, doesn't do any sort of thing for me at all, except maybe move our country in the right direction. And the fact is, if I didn't think we had a possibility of winning, I wouldn't do it. But I am a firm believer in the non-aggression principle as a moral and ethical imperative. But I don't think it's a good political principle, because it really only tells you what not to do. And politics is all about what to do. And politics is about control. And it's like uh, we want to con we want to use power and control in order to bring more power and control to the individual. So we we keep the non-aggression principle, and then I want to add a second principle, the positive empowerment principle, which means maximize the power of individuals to control themselves, their property, and their environment, as long as they're not infringing on the rights of others. Now. Where does that bring us today? What can we do, what can you do today to increase your own power, your own potential to influence the people who are more powerful than you? The goal is to give you more power and to take power away from people who are too powerful. Well, 
I would say that there are um, a couple candidates who are more powerful than me. And there's uh, at least one candidate, I don't have any more power than you. Uh, all I can do is talk. So uh, let me give you, I, I don't like to be negative, but you know, I, I, it's the way I feel on the top. Uh, I was invited to speak at the uh, Libertarian Party. Uh, I'm not going to say which city, because I, I don't think it's right. But they call themselves the Free State. <laughs> uh, this was a small convention, about uh, charitably 15 or 20 people, I think it was the back of the Denny's or something. Uh, but I went, in fact, uh, I went, it was on the weekend. I was in the middle of a vacation in Chicago seeing my son who's in medical school. But I took the time out because they want, really wanted to get candidates in. They thought it would be good, it would help get people there. They wanted, and I wanted to help that Libertarian Party. So I went there. Now, they said that they were going to have a, a, a little debate. They were going to have a forum. And after the forum, after each candidate got to speak, they would take a vote. And whoever won the vote, they guaranteed their chair, who would be a delegate to the convention, at least on the first ballot, would vote for that candidate. Now, um, as you might have guessed, this, we're talking about New Hampshire. Does anybody here know what that vote was? Show of hands. Anyone know how that vote went? Nobody knows. Okay, so I would say they didn't have a lot of influence. Well, they heard from three candidates, Dr. Mark Feldman, uh, Mr. Daryl Perry, who was also, I think, their former chair and maybe their vice chair of the party, and a fellow by the name of uh, uh, Reed, Michael David Reed, I think. Not, none of the major candidates. But we were the three who took time out and went there to, to talk to them. So they evaluated each of us, and uh, at the end, they took a vote, and the winner was Gary Johnson. Now, if that's what they believe, that's fine. You know, it's, it's, I'm again, I'm all about people, you know, empowered to do what they want to do. And I'm not saying it was the wrong decision, but I think if you look at the outcome of that, no one here knows that. And I can tell you that uh, Gary Johnson won here last time. Uh, I think he raised about $2,500 or $3,000. Uh, okay, thanks. Almost a little more. Thank you for a we'll, we'll do some uh, questions shortly. But but I do need to say is that if you vote for me and not for the others, if then this will be heard. This will make news. I'm going tonight to Philadelphia. They will know in Philadelphia that I was the winner. Now you got covered. No one's gonna be mad at you. People will say, well, it's because he was the only candidate who showed up, he's their region three grab. There's a lot of, you know, he's not accepting money, you know, he's kind of cheating because he's not taking money for himself, he's putting money. All these reasons and excuses they could have. But the fact is, Gary Johnson's winning these other ones, you're gonna have a different candidate. And I'll tell you, it will be good for the Libertarian Party, it'll be good for Gary Johnson's campaign. It'll, it will get us noticed, at least has the potential to get us I mean, people remember when Ben Carson for a while was ahead, or when Charlie Fierro was ahead. It helped the party. So I'm going to ask, please, send money to Gary Johnson, but do it on your own. You want to say, and he won't mind. Believe me, he won't mind. Austin Peterson, that's his biggest fear, is running out of money. If you support Austin Peterson, please send him money. But don't do it through the straw poll. Stroll, I'm asking you to vote for me. Not because I want your money. I'll, you know, I'll take five dollars for it. But you know, it costs me a lot more than that to get here. But I want to for a couple reasons. Number one is I would like to raise over three thousand dollars to support the Libertarian Party mission. And I want to have this be a landslide vote for who? Mark, Dr. Mark Allen Feldman, the physician from Cleveland? How did he win? That's interesting. We need to be interesting. Because in being interesting, there's power. I think I have five minutes left. I'll take a few questions. You spoke on belief, taxation, and non-aggression principle. Do you believe theft is a form of aggression? 
Uh, that is definitely a form of aggression. Now, you know, believe it or not, you know, my, my son says, uh, you know, people think you're stubborn, but it's only because you've already thought about things a lot. But I do have an open mind, and I used to say that I did not believe taxation is theft. And, you know, one of the few things Aunt, Aunt Rand said that I do agree with is A is A. We know taxation is taxation, and theft is theft. And I really didn't buy the idea that taxation is at a point of time because, you know, my taxes are taken out of my paycheck, and you know, if I didn't pay taxes, they probably would, I'm an employed person, they would probably pay me less, you know? But really, taxation is theft. But it's the worst kind of theft. It's not theft at the point of a gun. It's theft by deception, especially the income tax. Because, they, because they're, not, they're not taking money at the point of a gun. It's worse. They're taking money by convincing people that it doesn't belong to them. That's the worst kind of theft. It's theft by deception. If you can convince people that their own property that they own doesn't belong to them, then you don't even need their, they'll give, you it, give it to you with consent because they've been deceived. America's been deceived. You'll hear it from Bernie Sanders. What should we do with the government's tax money? It's not the government's tax money. That's the advantage of the, the balance and credit plan, is because it is that even though you still you don't get to keep the money, you can give it to charity, you can give it to government, but you control it. It's about control. That's what it is. Uh, down, Jack. Yeah. What is your uh, position on uh, pardoning either uh, Snowden or Manning? Uh, Man, uh, you know, I, just in terms of the detail, uh, Manning, I think I would uh, I would commute the sense the time served uh, and, and, uh, and should be free. Uh, Snowden, I have mixed feelings about. I'm not sure whether to uh, put him on trial or not. Because Snowden is a traitor to the U.S. government. Not to the American people, but he is to a government who's against us. So in a sense, I would like to put him on trial just to be very clear what he did before I would give him a full pardon and put him in my administration at a cabinet level position. <laughs> I think if he was assured of a fair trial, he would want it. Yes. What's your position on the TPP? That's the, you know, that's a, the trade pact. Uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Yeah. Yeah. That's they, free trade, you know, but it's also got a whole bunch of other rules. Yeah, I apologize. But, but, but yeah, basically, I don't get too excited about these things. Uh, what I usually say, you know, if free trade is free, you don't need an agreement. You know, I mean, that to me, I don't really understand. And, and the fact is, trade should be freer, but it's, all, it's a lot of it is politics. And a lot of it is Democrats versus Republicans, and who's making the money, and who's getting the, My point is, if, if we have the balance and credit plan, we, we can turn this around so that people will support the, the programs that, that they think are important. So I'm not a, I, I can't say I'm really in favor or against that. Overall, I'm against because I don't think we should need those kinds of agreements. Uh, but, but it's a, but it's, it's a problem, you know, it's, it's a fight between diff different special interests. Uh, so it, it's hard to get too excited. Yes. <coughs> immigration. I have strong feelings about immigration. Uh, now, I understand people's feelings. Okay? We have a, a community, we have a culture that we maintain that's based on shared values, shared experience. We have people who want to come into that. And we don't know whether they're coming in because they really want to be here, because they, they want to support us, they want to, to help build with us, or whether they just want to take advantage of us. But I really don't think we should stop Republicans from coming into the Libertarian Party. I think we should allow some immigration. If the Republicans are coming for the right reason, let's bring them in. On the other hand, if Republicans are just coming in to take advantage, I think we should build a wall and make the Republican Party pay for it. <laughs> but in terms, of in terms of immigration, again, it's like everything else. Empower the individual. Um, the INS already has rules that if you have a spouse or you have a child who's not a, a citizen of the United States and you want them to immigrate to become a citizen, it's expedited. You just have to show that you're willing to sponsor them, that you can support them, you'll ensure that you'll, you'll uh, help to, to, to they'll be part of your family. I think that, uh, that that's great, and we should just drop the family relationship requirement, and we should make it a benefit of every American citizen to sponsor 
as few or as many immigrants as they would like to come to the United States. As long as they would respond to them uh, uh, and, and share responsibility for them and, use, and using private foundations and private charities to help to support them. But you know, how many, how many uh, Syrian refugees should we pay? A thousand, ten thousand, a million? I don't know. It's up to the American people, as many as the American people want to sponsor. And if you hear someone say, I think we should take more refugees, say, great. How many do you want to take? It's up to the American people. So thank you. Yes. 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 Could you give us a little uh, background and uh, bio of why you want to uh, acquire your doctor? How long have you been a doctor? What drove you, your family, your mother, father, and so forth? OK, well, uh, sure. Um, um, uh, my father's a, an attorney, uh, uh, mostly retired now. Uh, I'll, I'll share a quick story. Um, we were at a restaurant, and uh, the family got together. Uh, my wife asked to pass something, and uh, my father, she didn't use quite the correct word, so my father had to correct her. I said, Dad, you didn't have to correct her. We all knew what she wanted. He said, Mark, I was trained in the precise use of language. I said, Dad, I was trained to examine people without their clothes on, but I could restrain myself in a restaurant. <laughs> so, yeah, so both my, both my parents went to law school in D.C. Both my parents grew up in the D.C. In DC. Um, I uh, was initially uh, interested in, back in the uh, uh, 60s and 70s, I was interested in computers. You know, you know, but I switched to medicine. You know, Right there. Who, who would get success going to computers? And stuff? But um, but yes, uh, I went. Um, I uh, uh, but I've always been kind of a someone who looks for the opportunity, looks for how things can work. So uh, I was always good at taking multiple choice tests. I took the PSAT, uh, which uh, is the basis of the Nat uh, National Merit Scholarship uh, uh, Center. And uh, uh, when. Uh, uh, I thought I would do well, so they asked, what's your first choice school? So I liked a lot of schools. I didn't have a first choice school. So I looked at the data to see, well, what school offers the most National Merit Scholarship? Well, it was Northwestern University. Well, Northwestern University is my first choice school. So I did well on the test, and I ended up getting a National Merit Scholarship to Northwestern University. So then uh, I went to Northwestern, and uh, I decided I wanted to go to medical school. But I need to pick a major. And I liked everything. I'm interested in everything. So what should I major in? Well, I looked at some data to look at what had the highest acceptance rate in medicine. And the highest acceptance, uh, the highest number in biology majors, but there's a, a ton of biology majors. Most of them could not get in about them. The highest rate was actually uh, divinity. Right? Well, I wasn't going to do that. So what was next? Uh, the next was philosophy. Philosophy majors have a very high acceptance rate in medicine. And in philosophy, you can pretty much take anything. So I was a philosophy major. I was a philosophy major at Northwestern, and I was accepted uh, to the only medical school I applied to, which was the number one medical school in the country, Johns Hopkins. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, only later, I knew that my father-in-law also was a, uh, uh, went to Johns Hopkins for medical school, and it turned out he was also a philosophy major, which kind of <laughs> makes it interesting. But, uh, uh, how I got into the Libertarian Party was uh, uh, I had moved from uh, Baltimore, from Hopkins. I was working at Johns Hopkins. I was on the uh, uh, assistant professor there. Uh, and I was recruited to come to, to Cleveland. One of my patients asked, uh, Dr. Feldman, how did they get you to move from, from uh, Baltimore to Cleveland? And I said, it was mostly because of family connections. He said, oh, that's great. So you have family here in Cleveland. I said, no, they're all in Baltimore. That's why I'm mad. <laughs> well, sometimes you need a little space. But once I was in Ohio, uh, I uh, was disappointed that the Libertarian Party wasn't running a full slate of candidates. And I, and I knew someone who was associated with the, with the party, and, and I complained about it. I said, uh, you know, and I had always been a non-voter. Uh, I didn't uh, register to vote until I was 50. And uh, I said, you know, you should have a full slate of candidates. A week later, I get a call in my office from the Libertarian Party saying, Dr. Feldman, uh, we actually do have a full slate of candidates except for Attorney General. We need someone to run for Attorney General. Would you, Dr. Feldman, be willing to run for Attorney General? I 
said I'm not a lawyer. They said, that's okay. Uh, uh, you don't need to be, and with everything going on in healthcare, we think it'd be good to have a position as attorney general. So I did end up running. Uh, I spent about $500 on my campaign, and I got 3% over 100,000 votes. So, so, you know, it is, which is illustrative, uh, and I did as well as, uh, as uh, nearly as well as the Constitution Party came with the Constitution. So, so that's how I got involved, and it really showed that it's not about money, it's about principle. And we cannot win, we cannot win against the Democrats or Republicans on the basis of money. They have more money. We cannot win on the basis of power. They have more power. We can win on principles and integrity. They don't have principles, and they don't have integrity, and they don't have any way to get it. And on that, we can win. Thank you. We're glad to hear you and have you here today. The Gary Johnson campaign is located right in the corner here at the table. I want to introduce Scotty Bowman, who's the field director for the Johnson campaign. Yay, Scotty.
state conventions in 17 days. He's at two state conventions this weekend. And so there's actually seven conventions today alone, so it makes it difficult for the candidates to spread out a little bit. And I believe in Austin. And I believe in his ability to band us together, to bring in people, yeah. and ultimately, I believe Austin can win. I'll just get somebody. He's the best brand ambassador that the Libertarian Party has seen. And he is out there hustling, he's talking to voters, talking to potential delegates, and he wants your vote. He wants your support. And so I ask you to consider, consider how best we can spread the message of liberty and freedom. And when you think about that, think about Austin Peterson, because he is the man who is going to do that job better than any other candidate. So if you have any other questions about Austin, what he stands for, policy-wise, uh, you know, he's a song and dance man. I'm not going to sing for you today. Sorry. I considered, I considered it briefly. Maybe I'll take some requests. But if you stop over at our table, I would love to have a longer discussion with you. Thanks so much. Thank you. 